Okay, let's just talk through some of the design aspects of the car, the wheel size, the axle size, how large the car is with respect to performance. So we want to maximize the distance traveled. There is, you can either design for speed or design for distance. And those are, those are two different designs. The distance traveled is gonna be the number of revolutions times the circumference of the tire or the wheel because every time this rotates once, right, if it hasn't slipped around on the ground, it's like it's laying down that tread on the ground. So one rotation, the car has moved forward the circumference of the wheel. If you're pulling this to make it go, then you're also looking at how long your string is and how long you're able to actually drive this motion, how long you're able to pull it. So the string is wrapped around a different diameter, the diameter of the axle, which is this little guy here, rather than the diameter of the wheel. So you have a little bit of a mechanical advantage going on here when you compare what your axle diameter is to what your wheel diameter is. The string length, so if you unwind the entire string and see how long it's pulling this vehicle forward, you can say the number of revolutions times the diameter of the axle. So you can see how many times you're wrapping it around that axle because that's, that's gonna be the revolutions that you get out of this thing. Okay, so combining these two equations what you get, and this is a distance the car will travel while it's actually being pulled by the string. So not coasting to a rest, but this is how much you're actually going to get a driving force out of it. So you'll have the, the length of your string. And if you look at the number of revolutions is string length divided by pi dA. So I'm just rearranging that and substituting for revolutions here. So revolutions is equal to string length over pi dA. The pi's cancel out and you're left with the ratio of the diameter of the wheel of the car divided by the diameter of the axle. So if you maximize this ratio of how large your wheel is compared to how large the axle is, that's going to increase the distance traveled while this is you know, actually pulling the thing with the string. So look to think about your tire size and your axle size for this one. You can go from distance traveled to velocity. So velocity is distance divided by time. So again, you can look at kind of a units analysis on this. So the distance traveled is going to be the string length times that ratio that we just got in the previous and if we um, add rotations in here, a lot of times you'll see RPM, rotations per minute. So you can look at some different velocities going on here. But again, really, you're, you're worried about the distance traveled, not really the velocity. So the velocity would, would be a different design for a car. As you're looking through YouTube videos of people making cars, chances are you're going to run across one of these ones where you have a record and the mousetrap, and these actually, this design does very well. And again, when you look at this ratio, you want a very large wheel to a very small diameter axle. And that's exactly what this is giving you. Now the disadvantage here is you don't have a lot of room for a lever arm. So if you look at how much, how long your string is in this case, you have a very short string but you only have one axle, which minimizes friction. You have a big um, ratio between your tire diameter and the axle. So, so there's definitely some positives to this, but there's also the drawback of a very short string length to this too. You also have to um, kind of jury rig this. You have to weight down the mousetrap so that it doesn't flip around. So the weight of it actually holds it down and Increased weight increases friction and decreases energy efficiency. So pros and cons to every design, but you can watch some of these um, videos and see what you think. This axle here, you can make this out of an old wire hanger. 
Straws work really great to space things out. If you do have a washer or something that you can actually thread on here, getting a nice 90 degree angle between your wheel and the axle, alignment is very important. If your wheel is wobbly or it's not aligned, that's really going to kill your energy efficiency too. You won't be able to get it to go forward. It'll be fighting against itself if that alignment isn't good. So do what you can to get a nice 90 degree angle between your axle and your tire here too. Okay, so here's the other design with four wheels. And in this case, you can think about where the lever arm starts, where it stops. So the length of your string is going to be kind of two times the length of your car. So from axle to axle, your lever arm is going to be able to, to pull that twice. So the longer car, the longer piece of string. In this case, there's an upper limit to how long you can make your car, and that comes to the power you get out of it. So there comes a point where the <laughs> mousetrap is not strong enough to pull the string anymore. So you kind of, you can play around with the distance here and the distance of your lever arm and try and get that very edge where it just barely is able to get it to go forward, but then it's pulling it and pulling it, pulling it for a very long time. So lever arms, and I'm not sure if you've had physics yet where you've done um, springs, F equals KX, and moment R cross F kind of things. For a linear spring, and this is almost like the stress-strain diagrams from the previous lab, so force is equal to some spring constant times the deformation. So you stretch your string out, you deform it some distance, and there's a relationship between the force you apply to it and how much it's stretched out. This is for a linear spring, though. For a mouse trap, that's called a torsion spring. So we're going to replace x with angle. So instead of applying a force to stretch it out some distance l, you're applying a force to change the angle on that torsion spring. And you can think of circumference equals 2 pi r, or half of a circumference equals pi r, or some kind of distance equals theta r, where theta is in radians. It's not 360 degrees times r, right? It's it's pi r. So, so distance is related to angles through that radius. That's a neat thing about radians. But it's, it's a very similar relationship. Instead of f equals kx, it's f equals kr theta, where you have a spring constant, and you're applying a force, and that force is opening up your mousetrap some angle theta. And you can maybe turn this thing upside down, hang a weight off of it, and even measure your spring constant if you want to, to really understand how much friction is going on in your system and how much force you have to pull your car forward. Okay, moments, R cross F. So this is, it's really gonna come down to moments and your lever arms. So consider trying to tighten a bolt, okay? So you're applying a torque to this bolt. To do that, you need two different things. You need a lever arm, and you need a force that is perpendicular to that lever arm. If I just push on it, that's not rotating it. So you, that's the really important part is the force has to be perpendicular. And the larger your lever arm is, the larger the torque is going to be. So if you think about what's happening with wrapping the string around an axle versus what the tire is doing, so you have the radius of your axle for what your spring your string is pulling. So maybe the string has a large force. It has the mousetrap force on it. So large force, small radius, and what that's going to translate to is large radius and a much smaller force. So large radius, small force between your wheel and the street will be created from a large force on that small radius. And playing around with the diameter of your radius and the radius of your tire, that will, again, it, there's a mechanical advantage there that you'll want to experiment and kind of find the edge of, of where that's happening. 
So think about the lever arms and the mechanical advantages going on. And there's some YouTubes you can watch for that if you want to think through it a little bit more in depth. Um, there's some people that have set up gears, actually. And I've seen some YouTubes like this. To get one of these to actually work is quite difficult. I will um, warn you, a simpler design, the keep it simple principle generally is going to get you the best results on this one. But um, if you look at actual transmission systems and cars and the gear ratios, or maybe you just have a little RC car and you have a gearbox going on in there, you look at where the gears come together, okay, and those teeth have the same velocity. That velocity you can get from the RPM on one side versus the RPM on the other side. So you can kind of relate how fast one side is rotating versus how fast the other side is rotating by just velocity is equal to R times the angular velocity. Angular velocity is instead of meters per second, it's radians per second. So it's kind of the same as circumference equals two pi R or distance is R times theta. Change in distance over time is change in theta over time. So the um, ratio of the small to large gear is also the inverse of the relationship of the rotations per minute. So you can see how fast different gears are spinning for that. So a lot of really good physics in here. You've got potential energy to kinetic energy. Friction. Friction is your enemy. This is what's going to, um, you know, if there was no friction, your car would keep going and going and going and it would never stop. Friction is the reason it stops. And if you haven't done anything with friction before, the, the main thing you need to know is that experimentally it was shown that friction is dependent on the normal force. Or kind of if, if you have an object sitting on the ground and you're pushing at it, the larger, the more massive the object is, the more friction force you're going to get. So minimize weight and you will minimize the friction with the axles, the friction with the road, the friction in every piece of it if you just keep it lightweight. So that's number one way to have an energy efficient car is just to have a lightweight car and minimize that friction. Um, yeah, so think about where all the places that the friction has. So wherever the axle is rubbing up against the frame, see if you can minimize that. And um, I don't think, so here's um, static versus kinetic friction. If it's sliding around, so where the axle touches the frame, that's going to be a kinetic friction. Static is going to be where the tire hits the ground. So unless it's actually skidding on the ground, then it's going to be a static friction coefficient on the ground. Really hard to measure these values. Plus or minus 30% uncertainty or more. Um, rolling friction. Everyone is going to be tempted to put like a rubber band or something around the edge of their tire. Don't do that. So unless you're going for speed and so the tires are spinning and it but you're not going for speed, you're going for distance. So this is slow and steady will win this race. So slow and steady means you're not spinning out and you don't need rubber on your tires. In fact, if you have a hard, non-deforming tire, you'll get much better energy. This is a train versus a car. Trains have very low rolling resistance because their tires don't deform. If you want to um, transport X number of tons of goods and you want to transport those in the most energy efficient way possible, a train beats semi trucks just like 300% or something crazy. So, and it comes down to the rolling resistance of the tires is a big chunk of it. So you actually want just hard plastic on the floor. Don't kill yourself with, with tires. That'll give you rolling resistance. Um, you can see some rolling resistant um, tests that some of the car companies do, actually. And they will use the exact same car, same oil, same everything, and put different tires on the car. 
and then they just let it go from some height. So the car is not on, it's just in neutral. And then they let it coast to a stop and they measure the distance it takes for the car to coast to a stop. This is a real thing that, that manufacturers do. And nothing more than just changing the car tire completely changes the energy efficiency of that car. So your, your tires are, are extremely important for the fuel economy of your car, as well as, you know, traction and not getting in a wreck. So pay attention to your air pressure and keep your tires pumped up. But this is, it's kind of an interesting thing if you want to watch that YouTube. And you can look at the um, starting potential energy and then the friction bringing that guy to rest. So you could do an energy balance for, for this to see what kind of friction is going on inside of the car. Okay, so hopefully that gives you some ideas on some of the calculations that go into this. And this is just an intro class. So I don't make you like calculate any of these frictional losses or kinetic energy balance or anything like that. But just a little peek at that so you can think through um, the wheel size, the design of your car, the lever arms. So just a little bit of food for thought as you're putting this together. As you're designing it, if you can make something that is easy to slide the string around, so maybe don't permanently attach the string, have it on a loop where you can slide it up and slide it down that lever arm until you kind of find the perfect length of that lever arm. Or maybe for the length of your car, you put holes all down the side so that you can easily change the location of where your axle is. So make something where you can kind of alter the shape of it and test it out with a couple of different lengths going on until you can find the perfect length and the perfect balance that will, and again, slow and steady will win this race. So you want something that just barely starts and then keeps going. You want a hard surface, so don't do this on carpet and don't put tread on your car tires. So hope you have fun with it.